<laughs> oh, are we? Are we? <laughs> Good morning, and welcome to today's Finance Committee hearing. My name is Julissa Ferreras Copeland. I'm the chair of the committee. We've been joined by Minority Leader Mario and Majority Leader Van Bramer. Today, the committee will be considering three bills. The first, a pre-considered introduction sponsored by myself, Minority Leader Mario, and Veterans Committee Chair Eric Ulrich would extend the eligible funds exempted, exemption that is received by some veteran homeowners to the school tax portion of the property tax. The eligible funds exemption partially reduces the assessed value of a property purchased by a veteran with certain eligible funds received upon discharge from active duty service. Since 2015, the maximum reduction in the assessed value permitted by the exemption is $7,500. Until the mid-80s when the city adopted the alternative veterans exemption, the eligible funds exemption was the only property tax exemption available to veterans in the city. While the city no longer grants any new eligible funds exemptions according to DOF, approximately 3,200 veterans were grandfathered in and continue to receive the eligible funds exemption as of this tax year. In June of this year, the council passed legislation that included the school tax portion of the property taxes in the alternative veterans exemption. The pre-considered intro would bring parity between the two veterans exemptions and do the same for the eligible funds exemption. The second item is proposed intro 1722, sponsored by the speaker, which would require the Department of Finance to provide notice to owners in class two properties that they, were, that they are required to register the rent stabilized units in the New York State Division of the Housing and Community Renewal. In addition, ZOF would have to provide them with information regarding financing programs administered by the Department of Housing Preservation and Development to facilitate affordability. Providing owners with this information is an important step in efforts to increase and preserve affordable housing in the city. The third item is intro 1750, sponsored by myself, which would require the Department of Finance to mail or email new homeowners an informational brochure on property taxes. In 2012, the council passed Local Law 62, which required DOF to create the property tax brochures for Class 1 and Class 2 property, properties in an effort to educate homeowners about how their property taxes are calculated and what exemptions are available to them. These brochures are currently available on DOF's website, but are not provided to homeowners at the time when they are likely to be most interested when they are purchasing their new home. Therefore, the legislation would require that whenever a deed um, that would transfer home ownership in one to four family homes is recorded with the city register or the Richmond County Clerk's Office, DOF must mail or email, if possible, a copy of the informational brochure to the new homeowner. I look forward to discussing these measures with DOF as well as hearing from the advocates who work with homeowners and veterans. Welcome and thank you for being here today. I will now acknowledge we've been joined by Council Members Johnson and Cornegie, and we will hear from the Department of Finance um, as they testify after they're sworn in by my council. Hello. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee today and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Ferreris Copeland and members of the Committee on Finance. I am Michael Hyman, first Deputy Commissioner at the New York City Department of Finance. I am joined by Sheila Feinberg, Director of Intergovernmental Affairs at DOF, and Carl Lasky, who's the Senior Counsel in our Legal Affairs Division. The Department of Finance is pleased to testify in support of the three bills before the committee. Two of the bills will increase transparency and customer service for many property owners. The other will provide an enhanced tax benefit to certain veterans. Intro 1722, DOF is pleased to support legislation that requires DOF to include information regarding the registration of rent stabilized units with the New York State Division of Housing and Community Renewal on class two property tax bills due on January 1. There are currently 276,736 class two properties in New York City that receive property tax bills. In addition, DOF will be required to include information regarding financing programs that are administered by the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development 
to help facilitate affordability. DOF supports efforts to promote affordable housing in New York City as facilitated by this bill. This bill can also benefit the city's rent freeze programs, which are available to eligible individuals living in rent-stabilized apartments. Intro 1750. DOF supports this bill and currently provides property tax guides for Class 1 and 2 properties, which we make available by mail and which are posted on the DOF website. As part of our ongoing efforts to improve DOF customer service, we are working on a welcome information package to new homeowners to verify their contact information and to provide information about the property tax system. Current and future property tax guides will include information about tax rates, assessments, and property exemptions. DOF records each deed and deed transfer and has information on property transfers in the city, except for Staten Island. DOF does not have oversight of the Richmond County Clerk, but we will work to obtain information from that office. DOF will send through regular mail, and if we have an owner email address on file, provide an electro electronic copy of a property tax guide to new property owners of Class 1 or Class 2 properties specified in the bill. The pre-considered intro. Earlier this year, DOF extended the alternative veterans exemption to 53,000 property owners. Recently passed state legislation now extends the exemption of school taxes to eligible funds veterans. Based on fiscal year 2018 recipients, DOF estimates that this will have a positive impact for approximately 3,300 veterans. These veterans will see an additional estimated benefit of $502 in addition to the current $360 benefit, bringing the total property tax savings to an estimated $862 annually. DOF anticipates this bill will be effective in January and eligible veterans will receive the benefit for the second half of fiscal year 2018. Property owners who qualify will see the increase in their property exemption reflected on their April 2018 property tax bill. While worthwhile initiatives, we would like to mention that intro 1722 and 1750 will create costs related to postage materials and dedicated resources to help facilitate the seamless implementation of the initiatives. DOF will raise these costs as a future agency budget consideration. Thank you for your time. I'm now happy to take any questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. We were just um, saying that when you support a lot of legislation, your statements are like two pages. So that's good. We should do that more often. Um, thank you again for your testimony. I wanted to talk about the rent register. So that's the speaker's um, legislation. Landlords are charged $13 per unit per year um, fee to register their rent stabilized apartment. This fee is paid to your agency, with then remit, which then remits the money to the Division of Housing and Community Renewal. The financial plan shows 7.7 .7 million in registration revenue, which works out to just over 592,000 units. However, the 2014 Housing Vacancy Service survey indicates that there are slightly over a million rent stabilized units in the city. Can you explain the discrepancy? Unfortunately, not on the spot, but what we can do is go back and look at the numbers and get you an explanation. Okay, please do that. And um, other than that, would would there be, would be, other than what is required in the legislation, are there any other steps that DOF can take or other city agencies take, um, if you know, to encourage landlords to register their rent stabilized units? I think you know, this goes a long way to make sure everyone knows their legal obligations and then it really becomes a compliance issue to make sure they're doing what they should be doing and you know, maybe there's more we could do with cooperation with DHCR to make sure we have a full listing of who and has, who's registered and who's not and you know, compare it to other tax laws that require the registration. And we know that buildings can become rent stabilized as a condition of property of, of development or owner taking advantage of a tax exemption or abatement programs just as J51 and 421A both administered by the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Once HPD determines an owner applicant is entitled to a tax exemption, HPD issues the final certificate of eligibility. How does DOF work with HPD to ensure that the properties receiving these tax benefits are complying with the applicable rent stabilization requirements? Well, I think that goes to the, some of the initial requirements to get the final certificate of eligibility, that HPD verifies that rents are uh, compliant with the law and that uh, information has been submitted to DHCR. 
So I think one thing we could do is make sure that DHCR is following up and the registration occurs in a timely manner. And how is your communication, how does it work between HPD, for example, on 421A? You guys engage quarterly, are there meetings? How do you have the interaction to make sure that you're all on the same page and if there's any issues that are arising um, that you can address them? Well, HPD is the primary agency responsible for the administration of the program. You know, we administer the actual implementation of the tax benefit. So I think it's really more just inner city cooperation to make sure there's general compliance with the law. So some of that is through data, just checking to make sure the numbers look right, that, you know, that we're getting the final certificates of eligibility and that the, uh, any requirement is that is required is actually you know, that, that, that the follow through is there. So who notifies who when the tax exemption is no longer available? Well, the process is the final certificate of eligibility is issued to the building and the developer, and they have to supply it to the Department of Finance to ensure that the, uh, the benefit is being, you know, well, yeah, as you know, in, a, in like something like 421A, there's several steps to the process. First, buildings can get a preliminary certificate of eligibility, and then there's a time frame to get the final, which requires a you know, final certificate of occupancy and other documents. Part of that is registering the units with DHCR. So um, the upfront process, you know, has kind of checks in it. I think maybe what you're asking is just making sure over time that any follow-up steps are followed up with. So if units have to be registered with DHCR, assure that DHCR is doing the full implementation. That's the front end, the back end. Now their exemption has expired. Is that automatic, or how does that work? How does someone? How does someone get pulled from the program so they're not taking advantage of a tax exemption that they no longer? Well, I think we know up front the terms of the agreement. I think the issue would be if there's any special reason that HBD has to revoke a benefit, then we get direct communication with them. Otherwise, the terms are specified up front in our programs, in our system, this program to have a certain length. Because a lot of these programs also phase out, so the benefits are implemented according to the schedule and the statute. Gotcha. Um, and approximately how many pro properties have lost their exemption in the past year due to failure to register their rent stabilized units with DHCR? I'll have to get back to you on that. Okay. And if you can also tell us an approximation of how many units, um, I guess their exemption has sunset or are no longer qualified in a year, if you can just give us so we can understand how right. many come on as opposed to how many are coming off. Right. Oh, yes. So I think maybe it would be good if staff to staff we get right. a list of all your specific questions and we'll give you the answers. Fair enough. Um, what is the nature of our interaction with DHCR concerning rent regulated properties? Is, it, is there certain information about these properties that you're unable to receive from the division that will be helpful in allowing DOF to perform its functions? Is there anything else that you can... With DHCR, yeah. I mean, the basic process. You know, we're, I have to say, we're we do we're administering various parts of programs, like you mentioned, the registration fee and you know the benefits that are finally approved. But the upfront qualifications do require. If it requires a, a building to be registered, I think HPD upfront is involved in the process of that being that happening. You know, I think you know, maybe I'll have to check into it whether or not there could be follow-up steps to make sure, like for example, the DHCR process. You know, it takes a certain amount of time, and buildings aren't fully have started the process and haven't fully registered by a certain date. We could check to make sure that those steps are being finalized. Great. Um, and I just have a few other questions, and then I know the minority leader is going to be asking um, questions on his bill. Under this proposed law, how many informational brochures would DOF have sent out in fiscal 2017? The uh, which which one? The under 1750. Uh, how many do we have to send out? Or how many we have sent out, I'm sorry. If, if the law was in place now, right. how many would have been sent out? I can get back to you. I guess we'll look for the turnover of how many of the specified properties uh, turned over in the last fiscal year. We'll give you a good estimate. You know, as I mentioned, one thing we're also actively working on, which, which this coincides well with, is um, a welcome package that would go to any new owner and part of the purpose of that is also just to make sure we have correct contact information, because often when a title company is registering. That sounds like such a good idea. I, 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 we appreciate you Where did it. you come up with such well, a great idea? We're following up. <laughs> <laughs> great, great minds think alike. <laughs> so in any case, that's going on, but we'll get you information. What we can do is look at the last fiscal year, you know, for the properties specified in the bill, how many turned over? 
Okay. Um, and Minority Leader Mario and I were both talking. I think this, we worked on this piece of legislation, Local Law 62. Um, he did it with Council Member Jimmy Otto um, about this, what, these wonderful brochures. Um, and in the legislation, it stated that this needed to be updated periodically. What does periodically mean at DOF? Like we're doing it now. <laughs> You're doing it now? So the last time was 2012? Well, we always updated, I think. Well, hopefully we updated for just this, the factual information, like right. the tax rates or stuff. But I think we're also trying to look at it from a, um, you know, uh, understanding the, the specifics. Is there, or can we improve the mechanic, how we explain the mechanics? Because, you know, it's very complicated. Right. But I think the factual information gets updated regularly. We're now kind of looking at it more from a point of customer service point of view. Can we explain things better? Okay. Um, and I guess we also want, one of the things that was, um, I guess, I don't want to say special, but good about the brochure is that it's pretty layman's terms, right? Sometimes it can get a little very complicated when you're trying to explain our tax, property tax. So while we are trying to get this to be incredibly um, resourceful, we don't want it to be um, the white pages, right? Like a huge book of just right, right. We, information we that people are going to be turned off to read because it's so much information. Um, is this translated? I'll say it again. Is it translated into Spanish or any other language? I believe it is. I, it is. I'm not sure how many. Do you I don't know? know how many. Well, Can you circle back with us and tell us the languages that it is yeah. translated in? Um, lo, uh, neither class one or class two brochures mentioned that nonprofit ex are exempted. Is that something that you've been thinking about adding, or can you add about to discuss the possibility that if it's a nonprofit that owns the property um, and that there's exemptions, especially since we've been engaging in this whole program with nonprofits not being on the list, getting kicked off the list, you come back to us, then we got to engage. I think it would save us a lot of time if we can just add something about um, nonprofit exemptions. Okay. Um, for the brochures that you have, that you will have to send out in the mail, how much will the cost for the mail for each one? Well, that's where now we're quantifying, but we'll give you the information. Yes, I'd like that. And Local Law 62, um, would also require, I think we went through everything. Yeah, okay, I didn't want to repeat myself. Now we're going to hear from uh, Minority Leader Mario. We've been joined by Council Member Rodriguez. Thank you, Chair Ferreras. I just uh, I want to start off by, by thanking you again for your, for your leadership. Um, your partnership with me is, was instrumental in making sure that the alternative veterans property tax exemption uh, passed. So I, I just, um, an early uh, plug, but uh, we'll miss you here in, in the Finance Committee, and I just want to thank you for your leadership. Um, I, I want to start off by just one couple quick questions on the altern alternative veteran property tax exemption. Um, when, will the, when will the veterans see on their property tax, is that the January um, coming up? Because Correct. I'm getting, we're starting to get calls now, and I believe that you, finance has told us January that they're going to see it. Um, is, is that still accurate? That's correct. On the SOA statement of accounts that we're sending out for the January bill, it'll be reflected, and it also will be the full year benefit. Even and though. right, okay, the full year. Yes. And that will be online as well. Yes. Okay, starting in January. Well, it's going to be. We sent out the statement of accounts in early December, but it's for the January first bill. So okay. You'll see so, it. is there? Are they online now? Excuse me? Are, are they online now, as you said, December 1st? Um, I'll have to check. They could be. We're now finalizing the, in our systems the data. It's kind of done as a batch job. Everyone's being updated to get the school tax exemption. So I, I will get back to you as to when they'll be online. But the SOA should be going out in a matter of weeks. Okay. Thank you. Um, so for the eligible funds exemption, I, I believe you said uh, estimated benefit of $502? That, that's for a full year, yes. That's for a full year? Yes. So the, for the first one, they'll see half, right? Correct. We just want to make sure we get the, the language right because sure. if we say well, we 500, they're going to see two, about 250 right. in the we, first year, right? Right. We probably shared it with staff, but we can send like some of the tables that show the half-year benefit and what the full-year benefit Yeah, because we're, we're just 
once they see it, they're going to call us and they're going to say, I thought you said 500. So I just want to make sure that it's that's a fair half comment. of the first. No, this yeah. is a full year, but that, I hear your point. This is a full okay. year number. Do you have um, a breakdown of the 3,300 eligible uh, veterans by borough? We certainly can give you that. Could you please? Could you email it to us? I don't have it here, but we certainly can. Yeah. Definitely, yeah, when you can. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, we'd appreciate that. We have, yes. Or when you can, like 10 minutes from now. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Periodically, right? Periodically. <laughs> so um, just in general terms, so out of the 3,300 eligible app veterans who could receive the, um, the eligible funds exemption, most of them, if not all, can also receive the alternative veterans property tax exemption? No, it's generally, would you, one or the other. it's one or the other. So, I think so they have to, right, it's one or the other. But my point is they have the option of getting the, 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 the alternative vets exemption? I don't believe that's correct, but I'm going to turn it over to our legal counsel. <laughs> yeah, generally, there's a limitation on, you know, you can choose between one or the other. And I think that that period to choose is, has ended at this point. So you're, you're sort of in the eligible now. But we'll, Even with us passing this bill? Right. This doesn't have an effect on the ability to change between the alternative and the eligible. It just increases the eligibles. Right. Because I, I, I assume that if someone out of the 3,300, say, would get for the full year 500, but on the alternative they can get 600, they would choose a 600, but you're saying they cannot. Generally these not. 3, I mean, we'll double check that, but generally you, you can't. Okay, so these 3,300 vets do not ha have, obviously don't have the veterans alternative exemption either, right? Right. So they have actually nothing out of these two. Well, they're getting, you know, this, this is true. They get the current partial benefit. This will not. No, I'm talking about our increase. They do not have the increase yet. This is what will okay. give them the increase. All right, and then, so, and they can't choose. So the 3,300 are basically going to be locked into. There and do, the current okay, program. so do they have to do anything? Do they have to fill out an application to get the increased benefit? To get right? No, it'll be automatic. Just the same thing as the alternative exactly. one. If you if you have it, you're going to see it. You're going to see it. That will probably be you know given that it's being enacted now, you'll see it probably on the um, the next SOA, which will be in April. But it'll be a full year. I mean, it'll be a half year benefit. You'll just but you know just processing wise, it's not law yet, so we can't implement it until it's law. So it'll be the April SOA, but it'll show the amount for a half year period. Right. Okay. And then I guess next January you'll see the, the full. Yeah. Okay. And it's the same thing with the veterans alternative. Once you have it, you don't have to fill out it. Correct. Okay. Um, and I'm, I, I, and I'm just going back to the veterans exemption. I know I'm going back and forth, but I'm just, if, and I'm sure you don't have it, but do you, can you get us information of those who may be eligible that are, have not applied for the veterans? exemption? Is that information that's readily available that we can find out? We can explore what data sources might be available. Could you? Um, and keep I'm trying to think. I my office updated? Office of Veterans Affairs, or uh, I don't think offhand we have that analysis, but we can research it. Please, if you can keep us updated on that. Um, okay, I, that's it for me. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to follow up quickly on the welcome package, which I'm really excited about. I think, you know, we've been talking about this maybe less than a year about the opportunities um, and it's probably because I purchased my you know purchased the home and went through the process um, and can you tell me what that's going to look like or what are you thinking what is it going to include is it a document one pager is it a letter is what is sure well one one basic you know part is just welcoming and having people verify contact information, as I mentioned. And part of the whole process is we're also trying to automate the process so that, you know, you get you. It, actually, there's two parts of the process. One, we're trying to make sure addresses are improved up front when people transfer data. So things like the United States Postal Service has you know, address verification software that standardizes. So we want to make sure those are in good shape. And then the batch process will be, you know, once every two weeks or a month, we'll send out letters to anyone who's new. And then it'll be a basic, you know, we're, we're currently developing the package, so we'll, we appreciate input, but the basic information will be, um, we have this information, if you think this is correct information, including email address, 
please either verify it or send us a correction of what you would want as your contact information. Um, and then we are thinking of basic it's information, the brochure may do the trick, but information similar to that, basic information on how the property taxes work, highlighting exemption programs they may be eligible for, and then providing you know, links as to where you can get application information. And at what point in time is the walk? Is it after you move in? Is it when they're signing documents? Is it like when do you visualize that this welcome packet will be received by the homeowner? When they would receive it? Yeah. So uh, is it in the mail a month after you're oh, on your home? I think what we're home? hoping is that, so let's say you do a property transfer that goes into our systems of batch process within two to four weeks, we'll have um, an automated protocol that the, uh, the packages go out. All right. Well, I, you know, we would love to keep engaging with you. Um, after I'm gone, I know Minority Leader Mario will be following up on this also. Thanks um, for the idea. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm giving him, I'm challenging you to continue. Um, I think this is going to be a great, a great opportunity for our city to kind of keep engaging with homeowners who find this daunting and complicated and just want to own a piece of the American dream. So this is like a, a, I think a great thing for our city to do. So I thank you for coming to testify. I have no additional questions. We do have several points of follow-up sure. on data that we need to exchange between staff, our staff and yours. Um, and thank you for being supportive of our bills. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we're gonna call up the next panel. Um, Asher Ka uh, Kaplan from the Legal Aid Society Foreclosure Prevention Unit. Ashley Wegman from, not gonna, I don't know if this is your home address, so I won't say that. Oh, IVA. I, 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 A-V-A. IVA? Okay, come on up. Anna Bean, Lady Parts Justice League. Uh, I think that's another hearing. Or is, is this person here, Anna Bean? The Lady Parts Justice League? I think that's the other hearing, I think. Yeah. And Kristen Rouse from the New York City Veterans Alliance. Good morning. Hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Asher Kaplan. Uh, down like this. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Asher Kaplan. I'm a paralegal with the Legal Aid Society's Foreclosure Prevention Unit. Uh, as you may be aware, we work uh, providing legal services across the city, largely in criminal defense and anti-eviction work. Uh, my unit. Uh, provides free legal services for homeowners in Queens and the Bronx who are facing foreclosure. Um, I'm here today to testify in support of Intro 1750 on behalf of a team of attorneys and paralegals. Um, we applaud this effort to reach more homeowners with important information on property taxes and exemptions. For many of our clients, the amount they save through an exemption means the difference between stable, affordable homeownership and the slippery slope of interest-bearing property debt either related to taxes or mortgage arrears that can lead to foreclosure. This is especially true for our senior clients, many of whom are on fixed incomes and are not comfortable using computers. These vulnerable homeowners will benefit greatly from this mailing requirement, and we're glad to see this need addressed in the proposal. Uh, one issue my office is particularly concerned about are tax lien foreclosures, and um, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, I also really briefly want to mention one issue that's described at greater length in the testimony I provided. Uh, we've recently encountered a number of clients who have inherited properties that bear exemptions which they're no longer eligible for. Um, in a few cases, these homeowners who um, were benefiting under exemptions they're no longer eligible for were charged all of the money that they had saved over a number of years in one lump sum, putting them at risk for the tax lien sale. Um, we've spoken with, uh, I do some outreach and I work with the DOF External Affairs Office, and um, it seems to me that uh, in the brochure in its current state and among homeowners, there's a general lack of clarity about um, 
the requirement to apply to remove exemptions that they're no longer eligible for. It's also been explained to me that the DOF will automatically remove exemptions um, when there's a deed transfer. Uh, I just want to bring up really briefly two uh, cases that we saw in our practice. Um, one is a case of a homeowner who set up a life estate benefiting her daughter. At that point, uh, her senior and enhanced star uh, exemptions were removed. Under the, the rules of the DOF, that homeowner remained eligible for the exemption with a life estate on the property, but because of a deed transfer, those exemptions were removed, and the elderly homeowner wasn't aware that she had to reapply. So now the family is dealing with a large amount of tax arrears that can put them at risk of foreclosure. Um, the other is a client we had who um, inherited a property that had enhanced star and the senior exemption and continued to benefit, although she's not a senior and is not eligible for those exemptions. Uh, I'm assuming this is related to the state audit recently, but um, when those exemptions were removed, the homeowner was charged all of the incremental savings that they had saved over the course of the past three years all at once. Um, so this was kind of lack of clarity about the homeowner's need to apply to remove the exemption when they inherited the property. It caused a, a, caused a large amount of property tax arrears that we're concerned may lead to a tax lien sale. Um, Thanks for your time this morning. Uh, I go into more detail about those issues in the testimony provided. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for allowing me to testify. My name is Kristen Rouse. I served for more than 20 years of combined service in the United States Army, Army Reserve, and the New York National Guard, which included three tours of duty in Afghanistan. I'm here today to testify on behalf of the New York City Veterans Alliance a member-supported grassroots policy advocacy and empowerment organization serving veterans, service members, and their families across the New York City metropolitan area. Housing stability, to include affordable housing and home ownership, is a top priority of our membership. Among our membership are veterans who have recently returned to New York from Afghanistan, the Middle East, or other missions across the globe to find a city of rising rents and a market in which a key benefit of their military service, the VA home loan, is virtually unusable. Among our members, we also have Vietnam veterans who served this country and city decades ago and spent their lives contributing as citizens, leaders, and advocates and paying their share of taxes only to find that school taxes, which for decades were never included in their property tax exemption, have gone up by more than 60% over the last 15 years. Our older veterans have felt squeezed out of the city they've called home. Our younger veterans find the dream of using their VA home loan merely a distant aspiration in this increasingly difficult market. New York City simply can and must do better by our veterans and their families. For these reasons, the New York City Veterans Alliance was a key advocacy voice supporting passage earlier this year of Introduction 1304, which extended the alternative tax exemption for veterans to, at last, include exemption from New York City school taxes. We are grateful for the leadership of Council Member Steve Matteo and, and this committee in passing the first tax relief for veterans in many years. We also strongly support this new introduction, 6880, which would expand another key tax exemption for veteran homeowners, the eligible funds exemption, to include exemption from school taxes. Although not as widely used by veteran homeowners as the alternative tax exemption, intro 6880 would provide needed tax relief for more than 3,000 veteran households in New York City. These veteran homeowners matter, and we urge this committee to take immediate action to pass this bill. We further urge this committee to consider similar extension of benefits to the Cold War exemption, which eligible veteran homeowners can currently claim directly with New York State Department of Finance, but not the city. The Cold War exemption should be fully available to New York City veteran homeowners as it is across New York State, and it should likewise include exemption from school tax. On behalf of the New York City Veterans Alliance, I thank you for the opportunity to testify. Pending your questions, this concludes my testimony. Thank you, you may begin. Chairman Ferreris Copeland and distinguished members of the committee, on behalf of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, IAVA, and our more than 400,000 members, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. My name is Ashley Wegman. I'm a licensed master social worker and a veteran transition manager at IAVA's Rapid Response Referral Program, or RIP for short. 
RIP is IVA's high-tech, high-touch referral service for veterans and their families with a complete and comprehensive case management comp component. We assist veterans from all eras with any discharge status as well as their family members and caregivers. IVA's RIP team, based here in New York, is staffed by master's level VTMs, case managers who assist veterans worldwide in confronting significant challenges such as unemployment, financial or legal struggles, homelessness, and mental health related issues. The stressors that veterans encounter are frequently financial, and in serving veterans, we have seen firsthand the positive effects that targeted tax relief and tax incentives have had in improving their lives and easing their transition to civilian life. RIP has been able to provide a safety net capable of meaningful intervention to help stabilize both our national and New York City clients and their families in times of crisis, ensuring that transitional issues do not spiral into more severe hardships. Since December 2012, RIP has served a total of 8,354 veterans nationally, including 1,163 in New York State, 241 of whom reside in New York City. I will focus our testimony today on the specific veterans tax proposal under discussion in this hearing, the IAVA supported intro 6880. This legislation would expand the school taxation exemption passed within the alternative veterans exemption to the older eligible funds exemption for veterans. And after 13 years, IVA has become the preferred empowerment organization for post 9-11 veterans. While our members and clients are spread throughout the nation, we are proud to say that our national headquarters is located here in New York City. The housing tax incentives that veterans received are especially important as they help veterans establish homes, which in turn help them build their lives in, after their military service. The older eligible funds exemption was established to reduce the assessed value i.e. The, the dollar value assigned to a property to measure how much it is taxed of a property that a veteran purchased with eligible funds that the veteran received after being discharged from active duty. These eligible funds can include a veteran's pension, any bonus or insurance funds, prisoner of war compensation, mustering out pay, and other pays for up to $7,500. This exemption stopped being available when the alternative veterans exemption was adopted in 1984 with those who still receive it essentially being grandfathered into the eligible funds exemption. The alternative veterans exemption that was established in 1984 by contrast allows for a 15% reduction in assessed value to veterans who served during wartime and an additional 10% value reduction to veterans serving in combat zones. For veterans with a service-connected disability, there's an additional assessed value reduction that is equal to one half of the veteran's disability rating. Earlier this year, legislation was passed that allows the veterans who receive the alternative veterans exemption to also be exempt from paying school taxes on their homes. However, this provision was not provided to those veterans still using the older eligible funds exemption. Intro 6880 would address this issue and allow veterans that fall under the exemption funds, exemption, eligible funds exemption to be exempt from school taxes as well. It is for this reason the IABA supports Intro 6880. IAVA has long advocated for tax policies that work to empower veterans and their families. Examples of some of these policy proposals including IAVA's policy agenda include providing tax credits that reward businesses for hiring unemployed veterans and wounded warriors, providing tax credits to patriotic employ employers who pay the difference between a reserve and National Guard members mil civilian salaries and military wages when they are called to active duty, and allowing taxpayers to designate a portion of their income tax payment to homeless veterans. In addition to intro 6880, we encourage this committee to introduce proposals similar to tax proposals within IAVA's policy agenda. Given the challenges that veterans, are, uh, veterans encounter when transitioning from military to civilian life, it is vitally important that we put forth policies that allow veterans to establish homes during and after their military service. Members of the committee, thank you again for the opportunity to share IAVA's views on this legislation today. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much, and um, thank you for, one, the history, but also the suggestions. I know there's one in particular about assigning taxpayers to designate a portion of their income tax payments. That's a little bit more complicated, um, but I don't think we are, in, it's not in our purview, but also, um, uh, it, it, you know, has some conflicting parts of it. But thank you for your, your testimony and for your suggestions that we will be taking, looking into them. Um, I know Minority Leader uh, Mario has a few questions that can follow up. And also thank you on the foreclosure. Um, we're gonna be following up on some of the recommendations that you stated in the, um, in, in the, um, in your testimony. I think it's, you know, we focus so much on making sure that people that qualify stay on, 
but you know it has to be equally easy to be able to get off when you need to get off. So thank you for that. Um, Minority Leader Matthew. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for for Kristen and Ashley, I, I, you know when we when we we're passing the veterans tax exemption and, and now this, we, you know we're all still concerned that veterans are not they don't know about the exemptions and um, you know. I, when we have do you know doing a lot of press and going to veterans events and, and meetings and talking about it, you know there there there's still confusion. Um, so I was wondering if you, you guys can share um, your thoughts and confusion if, if there is confusion on behalf of veterans contacting you that says we don't even know that we can get this exemption or you know a lot of the confusion is we have it do we have to do anything else and the simple answer is no you have it you'll get the benefit that we passed but. My question to you is to focus on: Do they do they even know the exemptions are, are out there for those who who own properties? I know, you know, you're also dealing with those who you're trying to to get housing and renting. But for those who have properties, do they know it's out there? Are they taking advantage? Mm -hmm. if, if you have suggestions on how you think there there's better outreach, we're, we're all ears. When we first convened uh, our members and we invited just stakeholders in the community, if you are a veteran homeowner, come and meet with us and talk about um, talk about veteran homeownership and, and tax policy. This was last year uh, before um, before in Albany the bill passed to to even allow this legislation to happen at city council. Um, but uh, when when we had a room full of veteran homeowners, um, there were se there were several who raised their hand and said they didn't even know that they might be eligible for this. Um, there's also really like very like specific requirements for like did you serve here or in this place at this time, um, which is also why I bring up the Cold War exemption, uh, which which reaches a a, a different category of veterans um, and who we have heard heard from uh, by email since uh, you know since 1304 uh, became a thing last year and. Uh, uh, and since it passed this year, and as we've been raising awareness that 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 you all are passing this wonderful new legislation to provide tax very need, you know long needed tax relief, um, people are asking questions. What about the Cold War exemption? I can I can read about it and apply with, apply with directly with uh, with New York State Department of Finance, but why can't I? Why isn't this honored in the city? And it's confusing, even as an advocate, to look through like the differences between state policy and city policy. Um, you know, generally the city Department of Finance communicates things more clearly, uh, but but not given that there's these things that the state, state offers that the city doesn't seem to be offering, and then and then would you get the school tax exemption on top of that? And and so I'm, you know, I'm glad that that you were you were considering that now to to make the addition, you know, to to make the expansion for the um, the eligible funds exemption. That's really important, and I didn't I didn't even realize that it was more than 3,000 people who were going to be affected, and that's that's wonderful uh, to reach them too. Um, the Cold War exemption could be could be even bigger. Um, I know there's a price tag uh, attached to that, and and uh, and that's definitely an important consideration. But these are veterans. You know, it's it is hard to, uh, for veterans right now to own homes in New York City, and um, and that that number seems to be declining. Um, and so I, I encourage uh, this committee um, to to keep keep doing for veterans. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I mean, I, and it's true. Like, I, I've been getting the emails about the, the Cold War as well. So we'll, we'll be pushing and we'll, we'll continue to advocate. Thank you. Is there anything that you think we can add to this welcome packet concept? Um, so it would be when a homeowner is transferring ownership or you know a new person comes either moves into New York City or buys a new home is there something else that you think we should be adding or maybe even to this brochure that would be helpful I know that you had stated um, to more clearly explain um, how to get in and how to get out um, but also more clearly explain that the exemptions that are available but is there anything else that we may be missing yeah um, I'd like to speak to that uh, and to the previous question um, I think to uh, Councilmember, uh, I'm sorry, Mateo. Um, I think the short answer is no. Many homeowners, veterans, and, and and other homeowners eligible for other exemptions are not aware of the exemptions they're eligible for. Um, as a foreclosure prevention direct service worker, we often kind of screen people as they come in and and see if there are any exemptions available that they're not enrolled in. Uh, 
you know, the talk in my office is that in an ideal world, people would be automatically enrolled in exemptions they're eligible for. And I wonder if between a few different city agencies, they have enough information on the homeowner to determine if they're eligible and automatically enroll them. I also our, don't know. Our problem oh. is, is historically that has been an issue for our city and the Comptroller did a whole um, auditing because we were giving exemptions that people weren't qualified sure. for. So in you know the bureaucracy of government, unfortunately, that's you know sometimes we don't necessarily do that correctly. So I, I hear the intention, which is probably a great one, um, but also as finance chair, I have to be uh, uh, you know provide as much oversight of our taxpayer dollars as possible. So that's the only reason why I don't you know we don't necessarily lean on the automatic, which you know logically makes sense but then it could propose a bigger problem for someone who automatically gets it that shouldn't qualify, and then we're back to square one. Great. Uh, one of the great parts of my job as a foreclosure prevention advocate is I learn something new every day, and I appreciate <laughs> your sharing that insight with me. Um, there's a lot to know. I would add, um, you know, something we'd love to see included in a welcome packet is information on foreclosure prevention services and kind of warnings about different deed fraud um, deed theft scams and other um, even information on on predatory loans and, and helping a homeowner uh, kind of review the mortgage that they've recently gotten and see um, if that mortgage is going to put them in foreclosure shortly and contact information for different housing counselors and foreclosure prevention advocates. Uh, I know in my office at Legal Aid we're working on putting together a sort of uh, toolbox for homeowners that guides them through the foreclosure process and provides them contact information. So I definitely um, would like to be in touch with the DOF about that in the future. Um, and uh, you know, I think a welcome packet is a great idea. I also, and maybe this is something you spoke to before, but um, you know, I imagine something that could be yearly sent out to homeowners around the time of the tax lien sale. Because one thing we know is that homeowners enrolled. Um, and certain exemptions are uh, protected from the tax lien sale. Uh, I'm imagining just a sheet of paper listing, uh, you know, these are the exemptions that are available. If you think you're eligible for any of them, um, yeah. you know, please enroll. These are the ones that you have applied now. Yeah. If you're not eligible, please remove yourself because it can cause a problem. So that goes out on every notice. There's like the, the 90 day, the 180 day, the 30 day. So it goes out as part of that bill, but great suggestion. We're so it. good that we already do it. I know I'm kind of new, so I'm learning. I'm, I'm <laughs> stuff too, but I thank appreciate you. It. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. Do you have anything else from your perspective that you'd like to see added or improved? Well, to to have like uh, highlighted wording about are you a veteran, and then as an entry point for uh, for things that they might be eligible for, and also to mirror that with the the New York City Department of Veteran Services to include that to make sure that that is. Uh, mirrored in their messaging to veterans as well. We have a, we're seeing a lot of veterans who are not using their VA home loan in, to buy homes in New York City because it is so difficult to, to actually use that loan uh, or to use that benefit. Uh, and so there, there may be a lot of invisible uh, veteran homeowners in particular. Uh, and we, we will do our best to, um, you know, to broadcast the messaging on, uh, you know, on eligibility and this, this, this you know, this, these exemptions now include school tax and, and to, uh, to telegraph to our viewing audience um, what's, what's going on here and that they can take advantage of, of this tax relief now. Um, and I know that, you know, that your constituent services are, are doing that likewise. Uh, and if, if uh, DVS um, can also, uh, really push that messaging through their channels. I think, um, you know, if we're all doing our best to reach our community, then hopefully more veterans and their family members can take advantage of the, this tax relief. Sounds great. We're good? Okay, excellent. Seeing no further questions, we really appreciate your testimony today, and I'd like to call this hearing adjourned. Um, you want me to, I can remind Mario. I'm sorry. Great, yes, okay, thank you, adjourned. I thought you wanted me to read this statement over here.